see me using my hands. This is called ASL. It stands for American Sign Language. This is my story. That's me. This is me using ASL and this is my interpreter. She will voice everything that I'm signing throughout my presentation. When I was young, I started working on the PCB. I worked for Williams Company. <coughs> When I was young, that's what the building looked like for Williams. Now today, you'll notice how much it's changed. <laughs> this is the present building. Some of you might be looking around and you wonder, those pinball machines, I wonder who made the boards? That would be me. I was a designer. It was my responsibility and my job to make those boards. The first job I had, I worked at Seabird. And then it changed over to Williams. And then to Bally and then the Midway. Altogether, 32 years I worked there, plus another two years as a technical designer. Then I also worked with the machine, so altogether, after those two years, for a total of 36 years I worked. You can see here on the photo, understand that I knew exactly what that meant. That was the electrical one. I identified all the lines. I would look at everything, put all the lines together, and I could identify them all. I knew them all. Thank you. Finally, my paper has arrived, thank goodness. I would look at the electrical design and the engineer would put it all together, give it to me. I would study it. I would look at everything, figure out exactly where all of the boards were supposed to go. That was my job. That was my responsibility. They would send it to the factory and then put the board together, give it back to me, and then I would put it up there. That's the driver board. That would be the first thing. Later, 
you would add the CPU. You're probably wondering if I went to school to learn how to do this. If I studied for a long time and worked my way up. I learned more and more from the basic skill. I didn't go to school to do all that. I became the PCB designer without having to go to school and learn the exact details of becoming a designer. What I did was use the black tape and red tape and put them together with the mylar paper. And then you would send it to the board. They would take that off, copy it, the tape would show where you were supposed to be, the machine would fix it and give it back to me. Then you could set everything up onto the pinball board. Later, after doing all that, that's when they sent me to school to the academy and I received an associate degree for that specific learning and studying that artwork. And I continued working that way after I got that degree. That was an old time. You can see that it was a really long time ago. <laughs> For many years, I was able to observe this and see all the different parts of the CPU and sound, power supply, and driver. You'll notice here where they're located, the driver under the CPU, and then the power supply located under the sound. <coughs> that was my job to put that all together and make it look that way. I also want to tell you a little bit about my life, three different areas. I'm a person with a disability. Also my education, and also about my job and friends at Williams and Valley. I went to the Illinois School for the Deaf <coughs> that's located in Jacksonville, Illinois. After studying there for four years and graduating, I ended up graduating from the School for the Deaf. This is a picture from that time. In the summer after I graduated, I ended up going to college. I took classes in electrical engineering. But at that time, understand that it was a real struggle to try to study going to school in a hearing school and everyone was just talking. I couldn't understand all of the speaking and I had no interpreter with me. So it was a real struggle to learn anything and to continue the education. So once I was able to continue struggling through that, I was able to acquire my associate degree. After that, I was able to acquire my first job at Seaberg in Chicago. The things that I worked on there were the coin-operated machines for hot and cold drinks, 
candy, cigarette vendors, and the jukeboxes. I worked for many years doing that, making the boards for those things. I also worked on the jukebox and test point fixtures there. And then at the beginning of the spring of 1976, Williams Project was planning to make the solid state pinball. Those machines were brought over from Seaburg for them to work on them there from one place to another. At that time, it was the electrical, mechanical pinballs. Those were what first arrived in Seaburg from Williams. I worked on the electrical jukebox. And then a month later, I knew that it wasn't 100% complete. This is the Seabird Corporation where I worked. That was the first one as we began the process of designing this and putting it together. You can see the inside here. When it was finished, you can see we added these parts. I was able to sit back and look at it and I thought, mm, I don't really think that's good and I don't really think that's going to be successful, but I didn't say anything. That was their job. So I just sat back and watched, but okay, here you go. Here's the machine. I'll just sit back and watch and not say a word. The VP, the president, the chairman, all the people that were above me came in to look at the pinball machine. They observed it. But I sat back with another gentleman, and his name was Steve Kordick, and the two of us just sat back and watched them observe it. They were all talking about it, we could tell, and they gave it a big thumbs down. <laughs> there was also another engineer named Chuck and it became very heated a big negotiation and argument over this machine that wasn't working they continued arguing and finally they left so the two of us were just sitting there and we decided this isn't our situation to deal with we just went back to work The same man, Chuck, from Williams, he came back. Here's a picture of the man he came with. His name was Mike Stroll. He was an advanced developer man in management. He was really nice. He understood lip reading, and so we were able to chat back and forth. He was very nice to me and very friendly. I really liked him, and his lip reading was really good. He put together a group, a team, to work together on this solid-state pinball machine.
he had a development room that was a private room where the team would work together on this pinball machine. So we started the process. I wasn't always there for that because I worked for Seberg at the time. I was a Seberg employee still. But the following week, Mike invited me to come to the pinball meeting, and we worked on the design for it. When I finished all the wiring and putting everything together, I gave it back, and he was really ecstatic about the work that I had done, wanted to know if, he would, if I could work on something else. So I worked with Chuck and we did some more work and wiring on a machine, put the boards together, designed it, gave it to me, I studied it. And I started making all the new PCBs. They would bring it to me, I would study it, look at it in the room and give it back to him and he would always be really happy with my work. When you're walking around and looking at all the machines, you can see all of the things that were able to be put together, and he was happy with the work that I did putting all the PCBs together. Everyone was busy trying to put together the first solid-state pinball machine. I remember all the people's names that were in that room working together. Ron Crow and Dave Poole, a game programmer, and Ken Fidenza as an electrical engineer, and Don Gusky was the PCB wiring installer, and Paul Dussault, the writer. They were kind to me and they had patience and understood and would communicate, me communicate with me because they knew I was deaf. Mike was the boss there and a few days later he asked me if I would stay there and work at his place and I was really happy that he had invited me to do so. Later in the fall of 1976, all of the PC boards with completed components had arrived. The driver board, when you opened it up, you could see that it was mounted inside onto the wall of the back box. The CPU board top was connected to the driver board and then the power supply was mounted on the right next to the CPU and driver. The master display and save display boards were placed on the front door of the back box. Then you could see that the wire cables were connected to all the PC boards and the play field. Looking at the view of pinball, everything looked much better than the original Seberg design, the first one that I remembered from last spring. However, understand it wasn't all complete. But we did continue to work through the past, to continue working throughout the year in 1976. We really wanted to develop, to develop the first solid state pinball. Mike came to look around the wirings and the boards inside in 1977. He looked at the back box and cabinets and everything, and he was satisfied with it and he approved it. 
everyone, myself, Mike, all of us together, played the first solid state pinball. And as long as it continued functioning properly, we finished testing and we found absolutely no problems. You can see what I was talking about with the boards, how everything is located here. This is the finished completed product and it was great. That's the one that was approved. The next day, Mike brought some very expensive champagne, popped it open, <laughs> poured us all a glass of champagne and we were so happy. <laughs> he gave a speech that was wonderful. He was so happy to have all the support and we, we celebrated the success of everyone working so hard and we celebrated together. That first solid state pinball machine had been released at that time in 1978. Also, that was the 6000 solid state hot tip pinball game. The other one was 4000 solid state lucky seven pinball game. We continued to work together almost every day. And in the fall of 1977, I had decided I really wanted to work for them at Williams. So I asked Mike, you know, I really do want to work here at Williams. And he said, yes, of course, come. I would love to have you work here. But he told me that I did have to ask first my boss at Seaburg and ask about having a transfer to Williams instead of working for Seaburg. When I asked my boss at Seaburg, he said, absolutely, of course, I would support that. Go ahead and go. I hated to leave, but then I went back to Mike and said, yes, I'm able to transfer from Seaburg to Williams. So they were able to sign my paperwork and give me the official seal of approval to go ahead from each boss. One for me to leave, I said goodbye to Seaburg and then transferred over to work for Mike at Williams and I continued working there. Near the end of the winter, the pinball prototypes, other properties, everyone, including myself, we all moved back to Williams. I was surprised because it had only been a year later that they broke away from Seaburg. So they broke away, we said goodbye, and I was glad that I had gone to Williams. I was really lucky that I had moved before they closed and separated from one another. When I had moved to Williams during that first month, that was the first time that I had met this gentleman. He didn't know that I was deaf. His name was Steve Cordick. He was the manager of the pinball game designing department. He came up and was looking at the new solid state pinball. And I was back there checking something. And he was looking at it and walking around. It was the hot tip one. He was on one side, I was on the other side. He was looking at it and he's just talking away, talking away. <laughs> I was checking it on something and I finally looked at him and I said, I'm deaf, I'm deaf, I can't hear you. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get some paper. So that's how we started communicating. We would write notes back and forth and that's how we would chat with one another. He got me. That's how the two of us met and we have stayed friends for 
many, many years while we worked and talked about pinball machines and we really enjoyed writing notes back and forth together. I really liked him so much. It's sad that he did pass away a few years ago, but he was more than 100 years old at the time. So I do really miss him, but wow, what a life. Understand that one there, Gorgar, that one was the first speaking. The first one was sound and speech pinball project. Gorgar was the very beginning of speaking pinball machines. I completed the original layout artwork for Gorgar and it was sent to the PCB company to produce a few PC boards. After the PC boards were installed, component, components arrived from the company. One of them was mounted inside the back box near the CPU board. Now, Ken Fidenza was playing the pinball and he listened to the speakers. Why was he listening to the speakers? Because I could not hear anything because I'm deaf. I noticed Ken's face and his expression. It didn't look good. It seemed like he was disappointed in it. So I was wondering what seems wrong with the game? Is something wrong with the talking? And he said it's something with the speech that seemed interrupted. For some reason, the sound wasn't correct. He didn't like it. He wasn't happy with it. So we studied it. We looked at the drawings. We checked everything that we could to get the speech to come out right. And everything seemed fine. But inside is what we decided. Understand there was an analog area and then also the digital area. So what was happening is that the analog area It was kind of condensed together with the digital area. So everything was kind of bunched up together. So that design needed to be changed for the analog to be separated from the digital. So we had to send that back and have that changed. So a week later, after we changed that, separated the analog from the digital, the board came back, then we were able to place it on the mount, put it all together, and then whenever Ken started playing the game, it was wonderful. It was absolutely perfect, and he gave it the big thumbs up. That's Ken there. I was really happy that we had been successful and made the first speech sound pinball machine perfect. I remember in 1978, I went to the pinball design department I needed to look at the bottom of the designer's play field and see where the PC board would be placed. Hmm. And I remember this man. His name was Steve Ritechi. I passed by him. Here he is. He was really young at this time, just so you know. <laughs> I needed to look at the bottom of the design so I could see where everything was going to be placed. And I remember when I passed Steve, I 
I introduced myself for the first time, and he was the one who was just hired, and he had designed the first flash play field. That was the flash. This is a picture of it here, the flash play field. I had heard about him, and so I was interested in him and seeing him for the first time. And we were talking, and he started talking really fast, and I said, could you please slow down? I was trying to lip read, and he was confused because he didn't know that I was deaf. And later, we were able to improve our communication from for writing papers back and forth and communicating better. He was proud to show me his first design of that flash play field. I had already known about him for many years that he had created many exciting things for pinball play fields. I was shocked and I was happy to see the skilled person and see his designs. And that's how the two of us became friends and knew each other for a long time. And he and I are still friends today. Another person, Mark Lafrito my best longtime friend, and still are now. I hope that he is here today. I can't remember the manager's last name. His first name was Dave. That was back in 1985. He introduced me to the newly hired electrical engineer for the pinball and the upright video game. He was so young at that time. Dave helped us communicate and explain to him that I was deaf, and he got me. He was really surprised, but he started studying sign, and he learned it and picked it up really quickly, and we were able to communicate. The two of us were able to work together for a long time, and he, he ended up using sign language to communicate with me, and I really loved him for doing that. He was a really cool guy. Also another person named Larry DeMar. Mark introduced me to Larry, and he also worked as a pinball player playing game programmer. Mark explained to him how to communicate with me and told me what I did in my position there at work. And he also tried lip reading and he did pretty well at that and we were able to communicate with each other and we also wrote on paper back and forth on notepads. He was really nice to me. Even sometimes during the day, I would stop by his place and he would show me whatever game he was playing and whatever he had programmed. And he would let me play and see the pinball prototype. And he liked to know whatever I thought about it and get my opinion and my comments after I had played the game. And I would tell him if it was good and I would help him improve the game or if it needed something different, we were good friends. And we're still good friends now. Another person that I want to tell you about is Roger. Around the early in 1985, we met at a game room in Williams. His name was Roger Sharp. 
I remember him when he looked really young, too. His hair was pure black. He had a long, thick mustache down the sides of his lips. <laughs> and sometimes during a break time, he and I would have fun playing all the brand new release pinball machines. We would play back and forth and have a great time together. And that's how the two of us became friends, and he was really good at lip reading too. I'm going to turn mine over to my friend Eric. I would love to tell you about my old times at Williams and all the friends and the people that I met there. I met some pinball playfield designers. I remember a lot of their names. Mark Richter, Barry Ausler, John Trudeau, Dennis Nordman, Pat Lawler, Dwight Sullivan, and there were some other names that I don't remember. But additionally, I often met and I knew some of the back glass and playfield artists named Tony Ramuni, Python Angelo, Pat McMahon, Greg Frerich, Connie Mitchell, and Paul Ferris, and also an electrical engineer named Chuck Blythe. Here's Roger here. I have wonderful memories of working at Williams and Seabird. Thank you so much for watching my presentation today. Thank you so much. Are we doing a Q&A?